So long I had traveled by stormy sea, where billows were fierce and cold. I heard a voice saying, Come unto me, and now I am safe in his fold. I will lean on his arm, on his lean arm, on his arm, when no tempest can harm. Can Tempest can harm. I will have no fear with my Lord so near. I will lean on the Savior's almighty arm. Oh, come to the Savior, He waits for you. He'll save you from sin and shame. Believe on Him. He'll make your life anew, if only you'll trust in His name. I will lean on His arm, on His lean arm, on his arm where no tempest can harm, can tempest can harm. I will have no fear with my Lord so near. I will lean on the Savior's arm. Jesus issues this challenge to anyone who wants to come after him and to be his disciple. This is as it is recorded in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what is a man is, does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? <coughs> for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. I want you to think of someone that you know who you believe to be a person of good character. Now lock in on his or her image in your mind for a moment and reflect on the things that this person says and does, the personal characteristics that make him or her what you consider to be a role model. What comes to mind? What do you see in this person? Chances are that very high on this list is commitment the unwavering dedication to being a good family member and a good friend, to doing his or her best at whatever job they may undertake, to doing what's right, what is noble, and what is decent. Committed people like the role model you may have in mind is have their hearts and their minds in the right place. They keep their priorities straight. They stay focused on what's important. And they seem to know inherently that what they believe must drive how they behave and how they behave ultimately determines the character that they possess, the reputation that they enjoy, and of course the legacy that they will leave. Abraham Lincoln is accredited with this quote, commitment is what transforms a promise into reality. It is the words that speak boldly of your intentions and the actions 
which speak louder than words. It is making the time when there is none. Commitment is coming through time after time, year after year. And commitment is the stuff that character is made of. It is the power to change the face of things. Commitment is the daily triumph of integrity over skepticism. The world-renowned pianist Van Cliburn, after one of his magnificent concerts, was approached by an admirer who had been in the audience. And the emotional fan grasped Clyburn's hands and said, I would give my life to be able to play the piano like that. And the pianist smiled and replied, I did. Well, how are you doing in your commitment to the Lord and to his church? We might ask, or look at what makes a successful marriage or a successful business or a successful expedition. What do these things have in common? Probably at least they all possess clearly defined goals. And the people who are in these relationships are focused. They know what they want and they will remove any obstacles that will prevent them from reaching their goal. Similarly, a successful local congregation of the Lord's Church is composed of people who are committed to Christ and who understand that when Christ called them to himself, he called them to his church. The local church then needs leaders who have a clear vision for the church and its calling to proclaim the gospel and to build up the faith in the body of believers. When no opportunity for spiritual development, growth, or meaningful fellowship is provided, poor commitment is inevitable. We are saved in community. Together, we are members of Christ's body and we belong to a family. We are citizens of a kingdom and we are joined together. And of course, this word together is a dominant theme when the Apostle Paul writes about the church. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 22, Paul said, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and, he, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Of course, in particular, Paul had in mind the Jews and the Gentiles of his day, and there was a great wall of separation between them and many prejudices between the two groups but Jesus came to break down the wall of separation, to overcome the prejudices and to bring them all together and to make peace and to build them up a spiritual house in the Lord. Over in the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 11 through 16, 
Paul continues as he writes, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And here Paul describes the process by which the church is molded into the image of Christ, where we are brought together so that we're no longer carried about with every wind of doctrine, but we are standing firmly upon the doctrine of Christ. And as he says in this passage of Scripture, we, he, he brought us together in the church like this, that we might be equipped for the ministry of the church. And so again, he talks about our being brought together. God's eternal plan to save the lost is realized in thousands of local churches of his people all around the world. The church is the centerpiece of God's grace of God's love, and of God's eternal purpose. Every baptized believer is called upon to live out the reality of this truth through commitment to the life of the church. And so how could we ever say that the church is not important or that it is meaningless when it is the church that Christ came to give his life for and to establish. He gave his life in order that he might establish the church and this relationship that we have being together in Christ. And so it takes commitment for this to happen. And commitment is more, of course, than just attendance to the church services on Sunday or whatever day of the week it may be. Although don't minimize the importance of the assemblies of the church, what organization, whether it's a business or anything else, can thrive or prosper when individuals who are supposed to be a part of that organization do not support its meetings and its times together? No, church attendance is important, but it's not the only thing that we are to be committed to Commitment is about involvement in the mission of the church as well. It is about engaging in the work of the kingdom. And this work of the kingdom is the most important work on earth. Only the church can share the gospel. And only the church can minister in the name of Jesus. Heads of state cannot do that. Powerful governments cannot and will not do that. The United Nations cannot and will not do that. Jesus entrusted that task to the church. And so the church is the only agency that God has here upon the earth for doing his will and carrying out his mission. We need to be committed to the church because it has a great task to perform. It has a great work to complete. We read in a, a lot of Paul's letters, uh, his salutations and greetings to various ones, people who were committed to the church and people who had even given their lives sometimes for the church. 
In the book of Philippians, the second chapter, verses 20 and 21, Paul wrote of Timothy, his son, in the gospel. He said, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But he said, Timothy was genuinely committed to the Philippian Christians. Timothy was one who was genuinely committed to other believers in Christ, to the church. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Paul makes reference to the household of Stephanus, who he says devoted themselves to the service of the saints. This word devoted gives us our English word addict. And in fact, some modern translations of this passage of scripture use the word addict, that they are addicted to the work of the church or to the service of the saints. This family, you see, was addicted to service. They were committed to the church and to its work. Over in Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4, Paul talks about a couple, Priscilla and Aquila, who were fellow workers of Paul's in Christ Jesus and were committed members of the church. Paul says of them in Romans 16, 3 through 5, that they risk their lives for me. Not only me, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. And we know he also mentions that there was a church that met in their house. And so these people, this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, were committed. They were committed, committed to their fellow saints, which is the church. Over in Romans chapter 16, in verse 13, Paul makes reference to Rufus and to his mother. And Paul says of Rufus's mother, she has been a mother to me too. And so this godly lady looked after Paul. We might say she fussed over him. She prayed for him. And she did for him those extra special things that mothers do for their children. She wasn't really his mother, but she was in the church. She was a Christian. And she was committed to this apostle of the Lord, this proclaimer of the gospel. And that means she was committed to the church. In Acts chapter 11, we have a reference to Barnabas, who was very instrumental, as we know, in bringing the Apostle Paul to Antioch and to getting him started in the work. Barnabas didn't have a selfish bone in his body, and he was known as the son of encouragement, as we read in Acts 4 and verse 36. In Acts 11, we read that when he heard of the growth of the church among the Gentiles, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. And so Barnabas was committed to the church. And because he was committed to the church, he was committed to those who had given their lives to the church. And the church, of course, belongs to Christ. In Acts chapter 9, we read about Tabitha or Dorcas. And when she died, her departure was lamented because we read that she was always doing good and helping the poor. This was a woman whose life was committed to the church. She was committed to others who make up the church. And so in all of these references that Paul makes and these salutations that he gives, he makes reference to these people who had been committed. And because of their commitment, they had the kind of character that Paul praised in these letters. You know, what does commitment to the church look like? Committed members of the local church always have a keen awareness. They know 
what's going on because they know they're other Christians. They don't live on the fringes. They are at the heart and life of the church. And what's happening in the church is important to them. They live their lives on high alert. And they don't forget to entertain strangers, knowing that such people may have been sent to them by God. They refuse to be indifferent to the needs of those in prison and those who are mistreated. It's as if they themselves were suffering, as we read in Hebrews 13, 2 and 3. They see people as God sees people. And so they care for them from the least of them to the greatest. And they know who the least are in the church, those who are easily overlooked or those who might be neglected or forgotten. And they respond to them. The committed church member will be found serving the least. And you won't hear them saying, well, I, I didn't know. They make it their business to know. Those who are committed to the Lord and his church have never lost their sense of wonder or their sense of awe that they are loved by God and hence their commitment to the church which is the body of Christ. Jesus said that anyone who wanted to come after him or to follow him or to be his disciple must take up his cross daily and follow him. It's not like we just make a commitment one day, but we don't really have to follow up after that day. We have to take up our cross daily. And as I say, this is not a choice that we just make one day and forget the next, but we must make that choice daily to follow Christ. And so the cross, of course, that we take up represents separation from the world because the man who was carrying his cross to his execution was finished with this world. He no longer owned anything in this world. And he was not taking anything that he had previously owned with him. He was going to leave it all behind, as the old song says. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. My friend, this passage needs to be burned into our minds. We're not to love the world or the things in the world. The things in the world are not to have priority in our lives. We must let the Lord and his church have first place in our lives. And so, my friend, I remind you that this world is passing away. All our commitments to the things in this world will simply crumble into dust one day. They won't last. The things we devote ourselves to here on the earth, we won't take them with us. The only commitment that will last is the one that we make to the Lord and to his church. And as the Bible says, this commitment to the Lord and his church will pay eternal dividends. And so if you're not committed to the church, I pray that the Lord will convince you through his word and through the preaching of his word that you need to be committed to the Lord and his church. Let's go to God in prayer. 
Father, we thank you, first of all, for the commitment that you made to come to this earth, to live in, in the flesh and to suffer as we do, and finally to give your life for us. And we know that that commitment was witnessed in the character that you uh, demonstrated while you lived here upon the earth. The kindness and the goodness that you showed to all people and not just to your own family or just to those that were close to you, but to everyone. And so, Father, we pray that we would have the same kind of commitment that will result in the same kind of character that it will create in our own hearts goodness and kindness and selfless living for others. And we pray, Father, that you'll help us to understand that we need to be committed to your church and to all aspects of the church, to its assemblies and its services and to the work that it does in our local communities and throughout the world. Help us, Father, to have a sense of urgency about the work of the kingdom, because we do know it's the greatest work on earth. And help us to be committed to helping our fellow citizens in the kingdom of God to carry out your mission in all the world in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, in reaching the lost, and in helping to feed and take care of those who are less fortunate. And we pray, Father, that you will, will be with us as we try to instill in our own hearts and in our own lives these kinds of characteristics that come from a life that is committed to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My friend, if you're not committed to the Lord and to his word and to his church, I pray that something we've said today may inspire you, may encourage you to, if you have at one time been committed but have left your commitment, to recommit yourself to the Lord. Or if you never have really been committed to the Lord and his church, to understand the importance of that now and to leave behind the things of this world and to be committed to the Lord, to his word, and to his church. Until we see you again, we pray that the Lord will bless and keep you. Beyond the clouds of greed and hatred, beyond the gloom of war and sin, beyond the lowering clouds of sorrow, the sun will soon shine through again. Do not despair when days are darkest, do not lose hope when clouds hang low. Beyond the clouds the sun is shining, Twist soon break through with cheerful glow. Beyond the clouds, the, clouds, the dismal clouds, the clouds, beyond the grief, beyond the grief and pain, beyond the strife, the strife of earthly life, this life, the sun will shine, bright, the sun will shine again, the light of love, God's love from heaven above, above each cloud with every cloud with silver Look up and smile, Just smile. each dreary mile. Each mile. Beyond the clouds, the sun still shines. The sun still shines. Beyond the clouds, at death's dark river. Beyond the parting here below. Beyond the hours of tribulation. The sun will shine again, we know. The Lord is on his throne in heaven. He even notes the sparrows fall. Beyond the clouds the sun is shining. Twist and break through to bless us all. 
Beyond the clouds, the dismal clouds, dark clouds. Beyond the just green, beyond the grief and pain, beyond the strife, the strife of earthly life. This life, the sun will shine, the sun will shine again. The light of love, God's love from heaven above. above. Each cloud with silver, every cloud with silver light. Look up and smile, just smile. Each dreary mile, each mile. Beyond the clouds, the sun still shines. The sun still shines.